Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily, I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, the annual Israeli Holocaust Remembrance Day begins tonight. We'll take a look at what life is really like inside a coronavirus hotel, and later we'll be going through some of the incredible media that is available for this year's Yom HaShoah online. Yom HaShoah, or Israeli Holocaust Remembrance Day, begins this evening. And so everywhere throughout the country and through the world Jewish community, people are coming together to show respect for those who were killed and also for those who've lived on. This is the annual day in which Israelis honor the over 6 million Jews killed throughout the Holocaust. And this includes massive candlelighting ceremonies, religious ceremonies and prayers for the dead, and of course the traditional sirens. One two-minute siren at sundown as the Remembrance Day begins, and another at 11 a.m. the next morning, where people stop whatever they're doing and stand at attention in silence. But at the same time, Yom HaShoah is a chance to take stock in the population's growth since that tragedy. And according to the latest count by the Central Bureau of Statistics, there are roughly 14.7 million Jews around the globe, the largest grouping of which is right here in Israel. In fact, the CBS says that Israel has about 45% of the world's population with 6.7 million Jewish citizens. And the vast majority of them are native-born Israelis, whereas only about a million are foreign-born citizens. Then next up is of course the United States with 5.7 million Jews, followed by France, Canada, and the UK with 453,000, 390,000, and 290,000 respectively. Still, it's millions away from the global Jewish population of 16.7 million back in 1939. Rather, the numbers today are just about 100,000 people shy of the population in 1925. Now, as we look back at the events of World War II on this year's Yom HaShoah, we're also looking at how far we've come. But unfortunately, a new report by the World Zionist Organization shows a sharp increase in worldwide anti-Semitism over the first quarter of 2020. In fact, according to the findings, at least one anti-Jewish attack occurs every day in the United States and every three days in Germany. Joining us now with more on these reports is Dr. Robert Rosette, Senior Historian at the Yad Vashem International Institute for Holocaust Research. Thank you so much for being with us today. Now, do you think that there's been more anti-Semitic incidents around the world in recent years? Or is it maybe just a, a difference in reporting methods? Well, it seems from all of the reporting from the agencies that monitor anti-Semitism that there is more going on these days, certainly in the last few years, and even within the last few weeks because of the coronavirus, we see certain kinds of anti-Semitism coming out of the woodwork much more than it was before the virus hit. So, so why do you think that is? What is the biggest driving factor? Uh, especially because, you know, I, I can understand why in Iran maybe there's a, a ramp up in anti-Semitism, you know, for political reasons, but elsewhere? Well, I think there's, there's no one single reason why we see anti-Semitism. And of course, it too has been called a virus or a cancer by people for many years, and it's not so easy to understand where it's all coming from. But certainly in times of stress, it seems to come out more. Something like this virus that's going on now, the pandemic seems to be bringing out even more anti-Semitic rhetoric over the social media and the internet and, and everywhere else than, than what's happening before. But certainly in the last 20 years or so, we've seen this phenomenon that anti-Semitism was no longer not politically correct, meaning that many people felt that they could come out openly with anti-Semitic ideas. If you go all the way back to the survivors themselves on the, at, the, at the end of the Holocaust, they still felt that anti-Semitism existed. The Holocaust didn't stop anti-Semitism. It just made it politically not so correct. But again, as time can't, went by, mm. it became less and less uh, of, a, of an obstacle, and it came out more and more. So. What do you do at the Yad Vashem Institute to fight international uh, anti-Semitism? Well, Yad Vashem is not a monitoring unit, and we're not mm -hmm. a somebody that goes into the halls of power and starts advocating. What we do is we deal in education and knowledge. And probably the most important things we're doing are in that realm and outreach through, through various social media, internet. We created a, a very sophisticated and I think a very good massive online course that's in six parts about anti-Semitism from its origins and then with an emphasis on contemporary anti-Semitism today. And we continue to write about it, we're following it, and we try to give it the historical context and perspective that it needs to try to understand it today. All right, well, Dr. Rosette, thank you again so much for joining us and stay safe. You're very welcome.
Moving on with Israel's Holocaust Memorial Day upon us, many around the world are also commemorating the Shoah. And one of the ways people do this is by visiting some of the most infamous death camps in Europe. But at what point do attempts to honor the victims cross into Holocaust tourism? ILTV correspondent Shanna Fold traveled to Poland to find out. How much money does Poland make off of Nazi death camps? So far here, in, the, in the Poland? Uh, uh, about uh, 200 uh, euro. Some hundred euros. I was in a very nice hotel with, uh, with my friend. 500 maybe, Zloty, so far. Hotels, taxi. Yeah, uh, uh, we'd booked the hotel before, but we just got a taxi here this, this morning. Uh, just a bit of food and drink. And that's it so far. Got a few more days to go. It's called dark tourism, and it's the retail of death and tragedy. I don't want to give my money to a country that murdered millions of Jews and is now turning it into a, a profit-making tourism industry. But it doesn't matter if some people feel they don't want to support the economy in Poland, because in 2019, more than 21 million tourists did and 2.3 million of them visited Auschwitz. That's 11%. Former Nazi camps are turning out a profit off books, films, and tours, which all have a price. Statistics show the largest numbers of arrivals of foreign tourists were in Malopolsky and Mazowiecki. It turns out these are also the provinces that house the Auschwitz and Majdanek extermination camps. Today, they're popular attractions. It's good to come on holiday and not go on a beach something interesting, something you, you're learning about. So yeah, we, yeah, that's what we like to do. Jewish themed restaurants are all over Krakow and taxi drivers we spoke with say 45% of people they pick up from the airport are planning to visit a camp. Here in Auschwitz, even using the bathroom costs money. It was one Zloty, which is pretty common in most places in Poland. Um, a new company came in a couple of years ago and got the tender. They raised the price to two Zlotys, which doesn't sound you know, that significant, but if you think that the, I think last year something like 2.2 uh, and a half million people and assume that everybody comes is going to use the facilities at least once, so you can do the math and see you know, what the growth and profit was, uh, all, all 100%. But former Polish governor Janusz Zaleski says Poland is just providing a service that people need. It is important to stress uh, that this is not typical leisure tourism as going to the beach or visit attractive monuments. This is pilgrimage to extermination places and it should be distinguished that even if there are benefits to tourism, they are connected from servicing pilgrims. Meanwhile, tourists and money are pouring into these sites, but where is the money going? In 2018, the EU and Poland's Ministry of Culture and National Heritage sent over 1.4 million euros to Auschwitz to maintain the old theater for activities and the International Center for Education. And in 2019, London's mayor allocated 300,000 pounds in a display of support for Jewish heritage sites. Pilgrims, they need service. So it's not making money because of creating an attraction for tourists. We poured over records from the Ministry of Tourism, but couldn't find an exact percentage point for how many come to Poland to see Holocaust sites. Museum directors refused to even meet with ILTV to discuss the topic of dark tourism and what the financial benefits to the national economy are. Which begs the question, how much is Poland profiting off the horrors of the Holocaust? There are roughly 189,500 Holocaust survivors alive in Israel today. And though they average about 84 years old, 32,000 of them are over the age of 90, and 800 are over 100 years old. So communications technology is not as accessible to them as it may be to us. And that can be especially difficult on a day like Holocaust Remembrance Day amidst the coronavirus crisis. We're well, here to discuss is Israeli psychologist Dr. Kamila Folkash Levan. Doctor, again, thank you, of course, for being with us. Now, what are the dangers associated with, uh, you know, especially to health, associated with loneliness and isolation? It's a very important question because when we're in an isolation, especially for older people, uh, physical movement is very important. It's important for all of us, but especially for older people, uh, because sometimes it's difficult, more difficult to move. Yes. So, and it's also very easy to kind of lose track of time. And this is also something uh, important to consider for caregivers, especially for caregivers that are family members that maybe before that had a uh, live-in or somebody else that took care of their loved ones. Yes. So it's very important if you can, if you need to put an alarm clock, 
to make sure that the medicine is being taken, that you eat. Pay extra attention to food that you do eat. There are, if you don't have food, so then there are many organizations that can also bring you, even if you don't have family members or close um, or loved ones that can bring it for you. Uh, make sure that you're stacked up, and all, including on your medicine. Make sure to move. Put on music. Put on music and then surround if it's difficult for you to stand. So even if you hold the back of the chair, but do move throughout the day at least several times because the deterioration of the muscle tone is much stronger in uh, older people. So it's something that's very, very important to consider. Now, I know that there are a lot of organizations that are, are working to help the elderly in Israel, but what, what can the rest of us maybe do to help, especially Holocaust survivors on a day like today? Mm -hmm. I think it's very important if you have loved ones that you know, or friends, or family members, or even a neighbor, if you're, even if you're not that in touch with them, do reach out, call, maybe knock on the door, of course, uh, abiding by the safety rules, see if they need anything. And it's not just on this day, but this day is or this time is especially difficult for them because many of them lost their families, their children, and the memories are swerving in the mind, and, and it's really a sad time for many, yes? So an extra sad time. But do be, aw be aware of them, um, of Holocaust survivors, and not only, but especially also uh, during this time, knock on their door or call, see maybe they need something. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe video they need chat a carton as well. of milk. Maybe video chat uh, as well for, for those who are capable. Yes, and you can also set up maybe uh, specific times that you can connect because uh, sometimes, you know, we get involved with our own things and we, we just forget and the day just went right by. But uh, it would be very nice if you can chat with them, if children can chat with them, even if you just put the phone somewhere on, on, on a table or something like that and they can just watch what's going on in your house and kind of be a part as though they're sitting inside the house with you. Um, it's very important that social connection, that someone cares, that someone's there. Uh, make sure also for the people that for elderly yes make sure that you don't get caught up in tv do watch but but uh, be conscious of the fact to get up and maybe read something maybe read something do something else stay stay by the window all breathe right. some air all right well camilla you've given us a lot to think about thank you so much for joining us thank you in other news as israelis enter their second day out of lockdown coronavirus cases are still rising albeit slowly the death toll has climbed to 173, with over 13,650 confirmed infections, 150 of whom are in serious condition, and then about 3,500 have recovered. But while recoveries have now outnumbered new infections in Israel for three days in a row, it's still too soon for celebration. LTV's Nittany Manson has more. At least nine more Israelis have now fallen victim to the coronavirus over the weekend. And while the latest to succumb apparently all had pre-existing conditions, it's still a tough pill to swallow, especially as the latest fatalities also include Israel's youngest recorded coronavirus death, a 29-year-old woman who passed away at Hadassah Ein Kerem's medical center in Jerusalem. Still, Israelis are now starting to regain some sense of normalcy as they venture out of their homes under the new slightly eased coronavirus restrictions. Even the hardest hit communities like those in Jerusalem and Bnei Brak can expect a lighter grip in spite of recent clashes with police and arrests over breaking of the restrictions. And then in two weeks time, the government is set to review the success of this attempt, at which point they'll decide to either continue rescinding restrictions or to reinstate them. The question on everyone's minds though is whether it's too soon to let up on the lockdowns. Officials within the health ministry say that Israel cannot afford a second wave of COVID-19 infections, especially without proper testing for those who are asymptomatic or don't show symptoms. And to make matters even worse, new research suggests a terrifying new reality, that apparently the real rate of asymptomatic infection may be as high as 60 to 70 percent, which is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it means that far fewer people are currently in mortal danger than previously believed, but on the other, it means that practically anyone around you could be infected. And if restrictions are lifted too soon, the death toll would undoubtedly spike significantly. Now, for most Israelis, restrictions around the coronavirus lockdown are slowly being lifted. But thousands are still in quarantine, either at home, in the hospital, or in one of the many coronavirus hotels that have been established. But what is it actually like to live in one of these hotels? Well, ILTV sought to find out, and we enlisted the help of someone on the inside to get it done. <laughs> Um, 
וזה בעצם הנוף שלי. קוראים לי מאי, אני חולה מספר 624. בעיקרון, את הקורונה קיבלתי במסיבה בפורים. התסמינים אישית העיקריים שלי הם יותר קושי בנשימה, לחצים בחזה ובעיקר גם שיעול. אני לא מעשנת, אני לא עושה את הדברים האלו, ככה שבאמת הרגשתי שמשהו לא טוב. הייתי צריכה לריב איתם בשביל שהם יבואו לכאן, בשביל בכלל שהם יבואו לבדוק אותי בבית. באמת לא עשיתי את זה, ורבתי איתם ועשיתי את הכל, ובסופו של דבר הם הגיעו לבדוק אותי אחרי ארבעה ימים באמת של עצבים והכל, קיבלתי טלפון שאני באמת חולה. החלטתי לקחת את המקום הזה דווקא למקום של וייב חיובי, כי... קודם כל, אם אתה כבר חולה, אתה כבר לא יכול עוד פעם לחלוט ואתה כבר חצי עם המחלה. דבר שני, אני יודעת שצדקתי באיזשהו מקום, כי באמת סוף סוף ידעתי שמישהו הקשיב לי ובאמת אני חולה וידעתי שמשהו לא תקין לי. הגעתי לבית חולים, היה לי שם רופאים, צוות רפואי, מדהים, אין עליהם. לא רצו שאני אתפס מיטה, כי אני יחסית. בסדר. והם לא רצו שאני אראה שם את כל המורדמים והמונשמים, כי באמת זה היה מצב נורא לא נעים. והוא פשוט אמר, ב-12 בלילה הצגתי לך הסעה למלון דן. המצב באמת כאן לא כזה נורא, כמו שמתארים. בכל זאת, באופן של פיקוד צבאי, של פיקוד העורף, התנאים שלנו כאן ממש טובים. אין לנו כאן איזושהי בעיה, הצוות כאן נורא מקסים ואדיב ומדהים. אנחנו מעבירים כאן את הזמן, משחקים, מדברים, שטויות, דיבורים, ריחולים עד ארבע בבוקר, באמת עושים כל מה שבאמת עכשיו היינו רוצים לעשות בבית, אבל נמנע מאיתנו לעשות. ואני באמת חושבת, לא צריך לעצור את החיים שלנו בגלל המחלה הזאת, כי זה משהו שבסופו של דבר זה יעבור, נכון? אמנם עכשיו אנחנו נחשבים כמצורעים וכלא טובים ודברים כאלו, אבל עוד יפה וזה יעבור. Moving on, Israeli political leaders from the Likud and the Blue and White parties are still hard at work in trying to cobble together a government. But now Hebrew News reports allege that a unity coalition agreement could be signed within the next few hours. Sources apparently close to the negotiations say that the final disagreements between the two factions have been resolved, specifically issues over judicial appointments and legislation barring Prime Minister Netanyahu from staying in office while under indictment. Neither Blue and White nor the Likud have given an official statement at this time, however. And this comes after weeks of stalled efforts and threats to pressure one another into caving into their demands. Gantz has even been claiming that the majority of parliament will support his legislation, which makes sense given the recent rhetoric. For months, blue and white officials and members of the left have been campaigning on ousting the prime minister from office. And just last night, roughly 2,000 Israelis, including former blue and white number two Yair Lapid, took to Tel Aviv's Rabin Square to demonstrate against Netanyahu. We're fighting for everything and anything that is essential to the future of this country of our, and our children, the Israeli democracy, and the way this government, is in a, its sloppiness, is handling the corona crisis. Ironically, though, while protesting the handling of the coronavirus crisis, demonstrators just barely maintained the recommended two-meter distance from one another, and many were either improperly wearing their masks or not wearing them at all. Also, as far as support for anti-Netanyahu laws in the Knesset goes, Gantz may not have the support that he thinks. Israel Beitenu leader Avigdor Lieberman and former blue and white heads say that they would not support Gantz's legislation if it's just to be used as part of some political game, adding that you don't fight alleged corruption from within. If you're inside, you're part of it. Well, it seems now that that burning bridge may actually be the final driver towards a unity coalition. Either way, we'll find out soon. And now joining us for more is Gideon Israel, founder and president of the Jerusalem Washington Center. Uh, now, thank you so much for joining us. Let's talk about the Judiciary Committee because that has apparently become a bomb that prevents Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu from exercising unity government. But is that still the case? Well, it, 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 could, it could be the case and, and, it, and it might not be the case. We know there's been a few uh, disagreements. One has been over the Judean Samaria issue, the judges issue, and um, the other one is uh, Netanyahu's legal issues. Um, it could be that Netanyahu um, is trying to run out the clock now um, and so he can get to fourth elections where he'll be much better positioned to actually um, have a right-wing coalition. What, what seemed to be three weeks ago a need to have an emergency government, suddenly th there doesn't seem to, to be a need for, for such a government now. And Netanyahu has seen the polls and, and how much better he's positioned. So it's very possible that the issue of the judges 
which has not always been so important to him in the past, mm -hmm. is just another issue in order to um, to to sort of stretch out the negotiations and kind of run out the clock on, on Blue and White and Benny Gantz. All right. So what what are Gantz's goals then in these latest negotiations as well? Because does he then also want fourth elections or does he want a unity government? What's best for him? Well, I don't I don't think Netany I don't think uh, Benny Gantz wants fourth elections. He's seen his he's seen his numbers in in the polls and uh, the 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 whole reason for the blue and white party was uh, a, a, a get rid of BB party. So once that the voters have seen that he's actually willing to compromise with BB and he actually has no chance to to set up an alternative government without Netanyahu, um, his platform for the fourth for for a fourth elections will be very will be very shaky. In terms of in terms of um, this disagreement about about the committee that that appoints judges, uh, Gantz wants the committee to 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 stay to stay as is in, in its in its current form, whereas uh, Netanyahu wants to have um, either that the judges be appointed with agreement or that he have a, a final veto um, if a, a judge is appointed that he doesn't like, and this is important because. In a hypothetical agreement, uh, mm -hmm. or the, the agreement that's been talked about between Blue and White and and the Likud, the Justice Ministry would be in the hands of, of Blue and White, and and therefore Netanyahu wants to make sure that he still has some control over that. All right. Well, it's going to be really interesting to see in the next few hours if any sort of unity coalition agreement actually comes to fruition. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right. Let's turn back now to Israel's annual Yom Hashoah or Holocaust Remembrance Day because you won't want to miss out on all the incredibly touching and heartbreaking programming that is still being scheduled for this year. Now, Israeli Holocaust Remembrance Day, or Yom HaShoah, is a day of reflection and connection. But with many coronavirus restrictions still in force, the normal memorials are set to look very different this year. Still, that doesn't mean the memorials are canceled altogether. Not by a long shot. Now, typically, there are big ceremonies, candle lightings, sirens for moments of silence, religious services to honor the dead, and more. And conversely, there are no theaters, public entertainment, open bars, etc. But none of the big memorials are happening either in light of virus restrictions. Instead, look to the web for a huge wealth of other programs. First, there are survivor testimonies. Listening firsthand to the survivors' unique histories has never been more important. And this year, the Jewish Agency for Israel will be hosting two special virtual events with survivor Leah Hasson whose testimony will be broadcast on Facebook in eight languages. Then there will also be a somber song by Israeli musician Harel Skat, along with virtual discussions. Meanwhile, the World Jewish Congress and UNESCO have similarly put out a library of videos and media for people all over the world to mark Yom HaShoah. And the whole listing is available at aboutholocaust.org. Next, there's the Virtual March of the Living, which will be live on Tuesday at motl.org, and dozens of other educational memorial programs. Finally, last but not least, the Yad Vashem National Holocaust Museum is asking the public to participate in this year's reading of the names. The full list of Holocaust victims' names compiled by Yad Vashem has been made public, and everyone is encouraged to record and publish video of themselves reading from the list under the hashtags RememberFromHome and Shoah Names. Videos should be no longer than 15 seconds. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. It's a very pleasant evening outside with a low tonight of 61 degrees Fahrenheit or 16 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow we'll continue to see sunny skies with a high of 77 Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Sarah Lenga, 41 years old, from Lodz, Poland, murdered at Treblinka. This is Yad Vashem's Remembering from Home project, where people are recording themselves, reading from their names. The entire list of names is available on Yad Vashem's website, so you can participate yourself if you're interested. All right, now that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.58 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.